Red One was delighted to hear that he could play the stick. He said an idiomatic Zulu that had washed his heart clean to see people from the Western culture interested in his own. And then he expressed the desire to put a few bulls, as he put it, so that he could see how much this Liam had learned from that migrant in Johannesburg. These two men are playing six or ugutalindu. Even in play, every blow which slips through one's defense is potentially dangerous, especially if it comes at a crucial moment. The smaller man is Sugumisa's Kaka. He's a very, very able young fighter. He's so quick that he's even able to hit the stick out of his opponent's hand as the opponent tries to strike. He's a very popular fighter in his own area because of the fact that he's able to use skill and finesse against a much bigger fighter's brute force. Sugumis is forever on the lookout for a prank. Kerry incites his older relative to challenge approaching men by saying, Who do they think they are approaching so arrogantly? My uncle, you are more than a match for all of them. <laughs> Give them a go. On one level, that was a fun contest, but on a deeper level, challenges established in the speed of call, especially when the fighting heats up. This was one of the great hallmarks of Shaka Zulu's injury, the fact that men just would not break, and he was able, therefore, to trust them in any situation. Now, while we were in Zululand, we met two platoon captains who exemplify the difference between the blood feud on one hand and the fair fight on the other. The captain you're now watching exemplifies the blood feud. You've already met him, Mbongu, the red one. He and his people fled from the war-torn area of Msinga, territory of blood feud. Feuds develop to blood, which under warlords become wars of attrition. Hit squads operate from Johannesburg to wreak havoc and disappear back into the city without trace. Three of the red one's unarmed warriors were shot while courting their girlfriends at a river. At the funeral, using guns and spears, the assassins again sprang in ambush. Homes burned through the night and cattle were driven off. Taking what little they could, the Red and his followers left for this, their new home. Biela. He typifies a fair fight mentality. At Mawandi, he engaged 400 of his men in a fair fight. In the clash, men fell, some broke bones, others ran away, but there were no dead, and come sunset, his men had won the fight. His horse, bugle and jacket are British military influences, which now have an intrinsic Zulu flavour. the men are carrying here are much smaller than the ones we've got in the gym. Now why is... There's still a strong military flavor to Zulu weddings, a legacy of the empire. Let me take you to a Zulu wedding where you'll see stick fighting in its natural context. 
People travel up to 30 kilometers over country like this to attend a wedding because of the fact that it's one of the most important on the Zulu social calendar. We were invited by a very old man, my personal stick fighting tutor. His name is Prince Gilanja Biela, and like all royalty in Zuland, he commands tremendous respect. His grandfather, Mkosana, was a general at the Battle of Asandrana against the British. History books don't really take cognizance of his name, but Mkosana is incredibly important still today in Zuland, and young girls use his name to swear an oath. As our party passes a settlement, a small platoon joins in behind us. They're fully dressed for the wedding. The sticks and shields, the living legacy of the warrior tradition. You may be surprised to see warriors going fully armed to a wedding, but this is because of the martial overlay of their legacy from the Zulu Empire. So, instead of them going straight into a Zulu wedding situation, they go to what's called Umkanyel, or Master of Platoons where the captains actually muster all the warriors beforehand. If there are any disputes to be settled, they're settled there on a hilltop, far away from the wedding itself. And once everything's been settled, the fights have been fought, the disputes settled, the, the captains then take the warriors down into the wedding situation where everyone is expected to behave themselves. And everyone who steps out of line in the wedding situation is liable for prosecution. <laughs> However, up at the Mkangelo, the master of platoons, all is fair in, in, in love and war, as it were. And the women are there as well. And in fact, men often will settle a, a lover's dispute at an Mkangelo. The bare-chested man is captain of his platoon, Indonesia's and Seas. Most of his men are young migrant workers just back on their Easter leave. If it weren't for their shields, one could well believe that they were urban blacks. But this platoon, coming in formation, exemplifies the fierce survival of Zulu martial arts in the face of other Western influences. The colourful man on the side of the platoon is the second in command. He leads in the singing. Women sometimes also arrive in formation. Parker's biggest regiment, in fact, was Infotamini, those who ripen at noon. It was a women's regiment. The armbands, studs and leopard skin vests of these women are contemporary traditional dress. Traditionally, women were a psychic inspiration to their men at war. Today, women still herald in their men's platoons. They whistle, dance and ululate. And this brings out a mood of bravado in the men and cheers them on for what could lie ahead. There's an atmosphere of excitement and expectation. A nearby platoon throws out the taunt. The captain shuffles his men into formation to accept the challenge. Balls with the red one. At the Sangangelo, this master of platoon, the men can challenge each other without disrupting the wedding itself. But the captains have to be tough to control the young hotheads, eager to prove their prowess. Individuals, platoons or platoon combinations will settle their differences in a fair fight. When, as now, there's no real enmity, the fighting will not be dangerous, but one gets a feel of what a serious clash could really be like. Many of these men will be back in the cities when Easter is over. Most of them as migrant workers in the mines, 600 kilometers away. As the women dance, 
the men may gear or do their ritual war dance. The gear is a stylized dance fight against an imaginary foe to show one's resolution to do or die should the need arise. These women carry a defense stick, upal, and a striking stick, umshiz, and wouldn't hesitate to use them. It's easy to understand the urgency these men feel when they're home for so short a time. It's been a long time since they've seen their women. And also unattached men have to get promises from the girls before they leave. Scores have to be settled between people if some kind of honor has been slighted. All these factors together gel to make a very, very poignant and explosive atmosphere. Once the men are back in the city, their wives and their affairs are well out of their control. But they'll talk about the fight, of victory and of running away. And they'll talk about the woman who saw them and their acts of valor and the promises they got. The more sophisticated city men often call the migrants Ondugiyami, which means, where's my stick? Because when the migrants are in trouble, they always reach for their sticks. But if there's no trouble, he'll dream of home. Perhaps dream of seeing his own girlfriend don the leopard skin and veil to become his bride. She'll dance with a knife, cutting off her past to join her future to his. And he and his territorial group will arrive from the city and by pinning money in the girls' heads, the world at large will know that they're no longer boys, but powerful men. And that power gets its expression through his gear, the war dance, his stick and his shield. Just before sundown, the men will again play sticks, Uglalindu, beyond the bounds of the wedding area. See this youngster here, he's actually singing his own private little dirge which he sings before he goes into battle. It gets him kind of psyched up. They actually play, you can see, very soft exchanges. But you still need a lot of skill for it. Someone's been injured and they're just attending to his head quickly. The man in the suit is on the retreat. He's probably just come straight back from the city, possibly on the morning bus. People run in to separate them because they can see he can't stand up to the other fighter. Social restraints are very important in domestic fighting. This is Sugumisa's younger brother, actually. A very formidable fighter. Here he's just standing, singing his song, daring anyone to come and challenge him. But there are no takers. Bad shot on the ankle. Must have just slipped through the man's defense as he tries to stop with the upwawo, or defense stick. But he smiles and gets up and goes for it again. The man below is trying to go on the outside and then swing inside. Notice the colorful pants. They shake hands. That means it's just a friendly little duel. The spectators are very necessary part because it's they who ultimately judge the fight. Sugumis and Tetu square up. This is probably one of the hardest ones we saw in Zuland because neither fighter would give an inch. And although they fight with different styles, they're both incredibly good. The shield has to move in your hand before you actually think about it. It's got to be an automatically, automatic reflex. The Udwanwe are the most powerful tribe in the region. But these Zulus are no longer an insignificant clan. Under Shaka, they have become a true warrior society and they are about to unleash a fight like nothing the world has ever seen. The Zulus. In just a few years, one man, Shaka Zulu, grew this warrior force from 400 to 40,000. This is the Zulu war dance, and this is how they psych themselves up for the battle to come. But I'm finding out that this is much more than a simple war dance. 
So, uh, all right, so Barry, what, 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 is this, what is this man talking about? Right okay, so he's the first guy, he's a senior prince. He's, he's singing the praises of, 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 of this particular chief, or Mkosi, right. and then going back by generation, generation, generation. It's an oral history and it's kept perfectly intact. <laughs> So when you stand up and you do your war dance, the rest of the guys all shout that behind you and you jump wow. and they shout your praises about what you've done in your life and your family and, your family and, your and everything. And it's just, I've done it because I used to do this stuff and you just feel as if your heart wants to explode. You feel so yeah. strong because it's like a massive force behind your shoulders just driving you forward. Ah, and they're all shouting his praises. And they're all, they're all that's, talking about that's him what, right that's now. That's what they're doing. So he's feeling that massive power I was talking about. They, Shout, they all are charting their own individual Yeah, this memories. is propelling him. They're propelling him forward. <laughs> Two very important, powerful shamans just put these bands on me. And uh, what Barry told me this means is that all of their ancestors, all of the strength that they come is now uh, with me. And um, that's a great gift, actually. Thousands of Zulu warriors took part in these large-scale surprise attacks. Oh my god. And the Zulus were so fast that in later decades, British commanders told their men to consider each Zulu warrior as if they were cavalry. Because they ran like horses. 